Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 7. In this chapter we're looking at cellular respiration or the metabolism of glucose to generate energy usually in the form of ATP to power the different types of reactions in our cells. So if we think about why we eat one of the main reasons is to get energy so we have to eat something like carbohydrates we have glucose for example and the potential energy stored in the carbon-carbon bonds within glucose. If we break down those bonds, energy is released that we can use to power different types of biochemical reactions inside cells, or we can save that energy to use it later. And this form of saving the energy is usually through the production of ATP. So this process of glucose catabolism, breaking down glucose for energy, is also known as cellular respiration. And we're gonna look at that today, the focus of this chapter. As we go through the different types of metabolic pathways that are part of cellular respiration, we're gonna see that there are many, many small steps or small transfers of energy within these pathways, and they all involve the movement of electrons. So as we go through the chapter, you're going to see these high energy electron carriers like NADH, it started as NAD, the oxidized form, and it captures electrons, creating a higher level of potential energy. You'll also see these molecules, FAD, which is the oxidized version, becoming the reduced version, FADH2. And these molecules, I call them high energy electron carriers because they have high potential energy when they are in their reduced state, and we'll talk about that more soon. We, the reason we have so many of these high energy electron carriers is because we want to make sure that when we're chopping up the carbon-carbon bonds in glucose, that we don't release energy all of a sudden and lose a bunch of it as heat. We want to be as fit, efficient as, proper, as possible, and we can do so by creating these small intermediates, these high energy electron carriers, as well as capturing energy in ATP as well. Interestingly, the final equation we're gonna see, or the oval or overall equation for cellular respiration is shown down here, where we're going to take glucose, break it down, and we need an input of oxygen for cellular respiration to occur. Once we chop up the glucose, I can see glucose has six carbons, so it makes sense that I'm gonna generate six carbon dioxides as my product or partial part of my product. I generate some water and then I capture the energy in those carbon-carbon bonds in the form of ATP. When you light a match, you're doing the same thing. A match is basically cellulose, right, fiber. We are giving it oxygen. We need oxygen to create fire. We light the match and what's happening is this reaction is happening right away, this whole reaction really, and I see this part. But instead of capturing the energy in the form of ATP, the fire is generated, the heat is generated instead of ATP. Since we break down glucose in many, many small steps to capture energy within each step and be more efficient without losing energy in the form of heat or as much energy in the form of heat, we do this by generating those high energy electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, through redox reactions. So redox reactions are chemical reactions where we are transferring electrons between molecules. Reducing agents are molecules that donate electrons to someone else. So they reduce someone else and thereby they become oxidized. Oxidizing agents will oxidize another molecule by accepting electrons, so therefore they get reduced. So let me show you this down here. So I can see AH is a reducing agent. It's going to reduce someone else. And it looks like that someone else is the oxidizing agent over here. So here you're going to transfer your electrons to someone else. And after you do that, you become oxidized. On the other hand, the oxidizing agent will be oxidizing this guy over here. And by doing that, the oxidizing agent will become reduced. So we know that anything that gains electrons is reduced and anything that loses electrons is oxidized. You might have heard of this acronym 
to remember this. Um, some, some, uh, some professors use lose electrons means oxidation, gain electrons means reduction. So I think how people remember this is by saying Leo the lion says grr. If I look at a couple of other examples, I can see that sodium is becoming oxidized. So this must have been the reducing agent. Reducing agents become oxidized. And let's see, the other one must be the oxidizing agent because oxidizing agents become reduced. And then another way to remember what is reduced or oxidized, you can use the acronym OIL RIG. So OIL reminds us that oxidation is lose electrons. And for the RIG, it's reduction is gain electrons. So whatever works best for you to remember what is reduced or oxidized, you can use either of these or your own method. So as I mentioned earlier, when we break down glucose for energy, we're gonna do this in many, many small, tiny steps so we don't lose that much energy in the form of heat like we do when we light a match. When we do this, the tiny steps, um, every time energy is released, we're gonna capture some of that energy, sometimes in the form of our high energy electron carriers like NADH. So the oxidized version is NAD+. And when this receives electrons, it becomes NADH, the reduced state. And this has really high potential energy. So I'll just put high potential energy. This one, you can see, is carrying two electrons and a proton more than the NAD or oxidized state. And it's called an electron carrier because NAD plus accepts electrons whereas NADH will donate or has the ability to donate electrons. And you can see these here. These are derived from our B vitamins. These are really important, and we're gonna see that in both this chapter, cellular respiration, as well as chapter eight, when we talk about photosynthesis. They're going to be eventually donating or re-releasing their electrons to other molecules to become oxidized again. And we'll see other types of electron high energy electron carriers besides NADH throughout the chapter, including FADH2. And then in chapter eight, we're gonna see something called NADP+, which becomes reduced to NADPH. And that'll be when we talk about photosynthesis or plants. And I always remember, or it doesn't stand for plants, it stands for phosphate, but I remember P for photosynthesis or plants. So I mentioned NADH, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide has high potential energy when it's in its reduced state. But we don't usually use NADH to power regular body functions. For example, like moving our muscles or breathing or pumping your heart. We do use it to generate ATP. And I'll show you this at the end of the chapter today. But what I like to compare NADH to is when you go to like have you guys ever been to like Dave & Buster's or Chuck E. Cheese? When I was a kid, we used to get tickets when we played these kinds of games. And then we would go to the counter and trade our tickets in for prizes, like a piece of candy or a toy. Um, nowadays, I think they use cards instead, which is, I guess, more efficient. But I think of NADH as these tickets. They're valuable in the sense that you can trade them in for something else later on. And we're going to see that this is the case for cellular respiration as well. We're ultimately going to trade in our NADH for the generation of ATP. So our main form of energy currency is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And this is because when we break down or hydrolyze ATP into adenosine diphosphate and an inorganic phosphate, and that would be cutting this bond right here. This is exergonic. It releases a good amount of energy, and that energy can be used to power endergonic reactions that are not spontaneous and require energy input. This loss of a phosphate group is known as dephosphorylation. So if a molecule loses a phosphate group, we say it's dephosphorylated. The opposite, if you add a phosphate group, is known as phosphorylation, and that's often done by enzymes called kinases.
So this is a generic term for enzymes that phosphorylate molecules. When you phosphorylate a molecule, it tends to be turn and become less stable and more likely to react. And we saw that actually in the previous chapter when we were talking about that sodium potassium pump. Remember, it pushes three sodium out of the cell, two potassium into the cell, and uses one ATP. That ATP, when it's hydrolyzed, the phosphate group binds to the sodium potassium pump and increases its affinity or more likelihood to bind to sodium and potassium when it's phosphorylated. And I can see in this case, uh, I can have, I have this enzyme, it's a substrate over here, and it looks like ATP bonded to phosphate will generate ATP. And here what I'm doing is I'm stealing a phosphate group from a substrate in order to produce energy that I can use later on. So in that picture I just showed you and also shown here is one of the methods by which we make ATP. So we want ATP, it's our energy currency. We use it to power different types of endergonic reactions. It turns out that making ATP also takes energy and that kind of makes sense because I know ATP breakdown releases energy. So the production of ATP is endergonic. You have to put in energy to, to do this. So where does this energy come from? You can couple it with some kind of reaction that released energy to produce ATP. And one method is known as substrate level phosphorylation. This is shown here in that picture I just showed you in the previous slide as well. When you literally steal a phosphate group from some other substrate and attach it to your ADP to make ATP, this is called substrate level phosphorylation. The second method is chemiosmosis. So that first method was substrate level phosphorylation, but it's not as common. The most common method to produce ATP is through our second method, chemiosmosis, which uses an enzyme ATP synthase and will be a big focus of the remainder of chapter seven. 90% of our ATP is produced by chemiosmosis. And in eukaryotes, this is gonna happen in our mitochondria, for example, in animal cells, human cells. In plants, this also happens in the chloroplasts and in the plasma membrane for prokaryotic cells since they do not have mitochondria or chloroplasts. So we're gonna look at the oxidation of glucose into carbon dioxide and the generation of ATP that happens during cellular respiration by looking at the different metabolic pathways involved. Glycolysis will always come first, regardless of the organism. And then if you have oxygen available, the next few steps include the oxidation of pyruvate, which is a product of glycolysis, something called the citric acid cycle, and then oxidative phosphorylation. So the first step of glucose catabolism or cellular respiration is glycolysis. And glycolysis is what it sounds like, the lysis of glucose. We're gonna take glucose, a six carbon molecule, and basically chop it in half to form two pyruvate molecules. And each of these has three carbons in them. Oh, that's an ugly three. So two three carbon molecules. But we're not gonna do this all of a sudden. We do this in many small steps, and this is 10 uh, different steps so that we can capture energy and make sure we lose a very small amount in the form of heat. We're gonna try to make this as efficient as possible. The inputs include glucose, some NAD+, some ATP, so energy is required, as well as ADP. And the outputs include pyruvate, also known as pyruvic acid, those high energy electron carriers, NADH, some ATP, and some ADP. So I can see this is six carbon glucose, and at the end I'm gonna generate two, three carbon pyruvate molecules. In my class, you do not have to memorize every single step of each of these metabolic pathways. So what I really want you to know for each of these pathways is what goes in, what are the major reactants, what comes out, where does it happen, what are the requirements, and then there will be some notable characteristics we'll describe 
and summarize together later on. The first five steps or the first half of glycolysis actually requires an input of energy. Because we have to initially put in some energy, we sometimes call it an investment phase, and some textbooks like to call it the preparatory phase. So if I look, I'm putting in glucose. It looks like I need some energy in the form of ATP. And one of the first steps, the very first step really, I see kinase. Don't worry about the specific name, but I see kinase. And I remember earlier, kinases are enzymes that phosphorylate things. They add phosphate groups to things. And I see that, oh, wait, kinase phosphorylated this glucose molecule. And the purpose of that is to prevent it from leaking back out of the cell. You don't want to lose your glucose and lose your reactant for this reaction. I see I need another ATP, and it looks like I phosphorylate something else again. And then it looks like I chop up the six carbon molecule in half into two, three carbon molecules already. The second half of glycolysis is steps six through 10. And it's often called the payoff phase because here is when I'm going to actually generate some ATP. And overall, I, I'll produce a net of two ATP. So if I look at step six and look really carefully at this figure, it looks like this, these steps, step six through 10, happen twice. Why is that? The reason for this is because remember, glucose was a six carbon molecule. And in the first five steps of glycolysis, I generated by the end of those first half of this, uh, the glycolysis, two three carbon molecules. And here they're just showing you one of those and telling you that this thing is gonna happen twice. I can see along the way from step six through 10, I'm gonna generate two of these high energy electron carriers because this happens twice. I'm gonna generate a net of two ATP because there will be four ATP made but I used 2-ATP in the first half of glycolysis. The method of production of ATP in glycolysis is substrate level phosphorylation, the one that was not as common compared to chemiosmosis. Since glycolysis is, is a reaction or a series of reactions that does not, does not require oxygen, then even anaerobic cells, cells that function in the presence or in the absence, I should say, in the absence of oxygen, they can still go through glycolysis. And for some cells, this is the only way that they can produce ATP. So let's summarize glycolysis. Glycolysis was when I took a six carbon glucose molecule and basically chopped it in half, forming two pyruvate, these three carbon molecules. I produced a net of two ATP. I produced a little bit, or really two, high energy electron carriers, NADH. And how do I regulate this? So to regulate glycolysis, I know that one method is by phosphorylating glucose to trap it inside of the cell as a reactant for this. Another way I can really regulate glycolysis and determine if it's going to happen or not is controlling the levels of NAD+. If you run out of NAD+, then this reaction will slow down or even stop. If you have too much ATP, if you have too much ATP, glycolysis will also slow down. So glycolysis, I remember, happens in the cytoplasm of cells, including eukaryotes and prokaryotes. And again, no oxygen is necessary. So it's an anaerobic reaction. Throughout chapter seven in our OpenStax textbook, you'll see that you are provided with different YouTube and video links to review the different pathways of cellular respiration. These are optional, you can view them, but again, you don't have to memorize the detailed steps of each metabolic pathway. All right, that takes us to the end of the first video for chapter seven. In our second video, we're gonna look at what happens after glycolysis.